Today we're talking with Tony Cox uh, at the Ripcord uh, reunion in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, the interviewer is Mike McGregor with the Grand Valley State University's uh, Veterans Oral History Project. Tony, to get started, uh, I, just got, I just want to get a little background information. When and where were you born? Here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, when were you born? Oh, when? Yeah. Uh, August 31st, 1949. I'll go, okay. And did you grow up in Indianapolis? Yes, I did. I've lived my whole life here. Okay. I attended high school? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, tell me about growing up in Indianapolis. Uh, oh, it how was would you describe your typical your Midwest, you know, uh, as far as growing up and stuff, I, uh, you know, I just went to high school. After high school, I, you know, it's a thing, get a job and, uh, you know, and have a good time. And, and, of course, there was always the draft. And, you, of course, the Vietnam War was always on our minds, you know, and stuff. And we used to kid each other about that, you know, well, about maybe being cannon fodder or something like that because, you know, we're going to get drafted or whatever. And, and, uh, and that was basically yeah, just a typical, you know, young man growing up. Trying to chase after the women and wasn't too successful at that, by the way. But uh, you know, did, just having fun. Uh, what, what did your parents do? My father worked, and my mother would stay. She stayed at home. Yeah, there well, were six of us in the family. Well, what did your dad do? He was a uh, he worked for the uh, Link Bow Manufacturing Company here on the south side of Indianapolis. He was a chain assembler. Okay. He worked pretty hard all his life, and. Uh, we may do. We didn't have a lot of things, you know, and stuff. But we, as far as quality of life, it, I, you know, I look back and it was pretty good. Uh, so when you graduated from high school, you said you got a job. I got a job. Uh, I started working probably right after my birthday in 1967. After I turned 18, I was then I was uh, able to get a full time job, and that's basically what I did. You know, get a job, uh, benefits, you know, so I could. You know, I could uh, move out of the house, get my own set of wheels, you know, and start partying, having a good time. A single young man's dream. Mm -hmm. You know, that was basically it. At that time, were you following the events in Vietnam? And uh, Well, uh, yeah, to a point, because I had a brother who served in Vietnam. He was two years older than me, two years older than me, Tom. And he had served in Vietnam, too. He served with the Engineer Brigade over, over there. He was over there about two years prior to me. Was he drafted? Or, uh, yes, he was drafted. drafted. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were kind of concerned about the draft? Mm, sure. Yes. Uh, and did you get your draft notice then? I got my draft notice, uh, and then that's when, you know, all of a sudden I said, well, I better do something about this. What can I do? So, of course, it was pretty late then. So I, you know, called, uh, made a few calls about getting in the National Guard, the reserves and all that. Of course, they were all full. <clears throat> you know, they're like, way before then. So, um, well, huh. so I guess, well, my brother was drafted, he went and served, I can do the same thing. So, uh, for some reason, I found out that Marines was, were drafting. I didn't want to go into the Marine, be drafted by the Marines. I don't know, I was 19 years old. I wasn't, you know, I just didn't want to be a Marine. So, I don't know. So anyway, um, I talked to a recruiter and he said, well, you can sign up for two years. So I became, I enlisted for two years. This is something they had going on at the time. Because most times when you signed up, you had to go for three years. So you, uh, when did you enlist then? Oh. The same day I would have been drafted, May 7th, 1969. Okay, and you reported to uh, basic training then? Or? Basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then, uh, you know, and I had taken, well, when you, when you enlist, of course, you take these better, you take these tests, and, and of course, uh, they told, oh, you know, I mean, of course, talking with the recruiter, oh, you want to do real well in all these tests, and, which I guess I did, and he said, oh, you can do any job in the Army, you know, you qualify for about any job in the Army, so I said, oh, okay, but it's still two years, so, uh, and then I went to, like I said, went to Fort Knox, and, uh, and then uh, basic training. Okay, uh, at Fort Knox you went through the reception center. The reception right? center, yes, those. of and course. And did they course. assign you your MOS at that point? Or no, you didn't learn your MOS till probably 
Gee, I would say maybe two weeks. Well, when you first got your, I don't think you knew until you got your orders. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, know I went through basic in 66, and in the reception center, mm -hmm. it was the last stop you did. They told you what you were going to do. I don't. I don't, you know, you could be right. But, uh, uh, it's been a well, while. Well, although you, you were, you know, three years after. Yeah, three and years I want to say it was until later, yeah. uh, you know, later on in your training okay. that you, when you got your orders, you know, when you got your orders and you, if you went to a particular fort, you know what your MOS was. Well, you yeah, you have to have anyone AIT tell you. at Fort Polk. You yes, know, sir. Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, you go, uh-oh. Yeah. Uh is this around. North Fort or South Fort? Oh, it's South Fort. Oh, okay. So you got your, towards the end of basic, you got your orders. I got my orders, or yes. AIT. For AIT, and it was um, Light Weapons Infantry, 11 Bravo, at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, which they call Little Vietnam, and also the armpit of the United States Army. But anyway, so... Uh, I went there and went for my training, and uh, <coughs> of course, you know, didn't feel I wasn't too happy with the situation, you know. You know Gee, how did I end up with this? Of course, I know how I did now. But that's, you know, water under the bridge. So. And uh, so I went through training, and while I was in training, or after my AIT, They told me I was staying for an extra two weeks. I was going to a leadership preparation course down there at Fort Polk. So I stayed two weeks for that. And then they said, well, now you're going to the NCO school, the NCO IC school in Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, I said, okay, I'm not going to Vietnam yet. Okay, I'll go with that too. You know, and then uh, so I went uh, down to Fort Benning and spent from, oh, I don't know, like September, early October, till probably uh, March of 1970 down there. Or, excuse me, let me go back. I had spent, I think it was 12 weeks, Fort Benning, right. Georgia, through training. And then after that, we went through, uh, pushed, uh, we went to a AIT unit back at Fort Polk. So uh, and that's basically what I did. That's what my training consists of. And I look back on that training I got through the NCO school, and it was pretty good. They trained you how they were fighting over in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I think by this time, I had resigned myself to the fact that you know, I was going to be in the infantry and I was going to go over there. So I, I guess, well, you know, I can get this extra training. Let's go ahead and get it and maybe put it to good use and, you know, and help me survive. So you had your, your, your basically your two month infantry at Fort Polk. Yes. And then you went uh, to Benning and the, what did the, we used to call it Shake and Bake. Yeah, school. Shake and Bake, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and we went, uh, I went there. And you did that, and, and how, how did that training, uh, you said it was more enhanced than the training that you had? In, well, yeah, uh, because, well, when you went through AIT, that was like, it was more, well, at Fort Polk, they did get into some of the, well, let's go back up, Fort Knox was conventional warfare. Right. You know, with your your teams and then your squads moving, you know, and um, and then when you got into AIT at Fort Polk, they, they got more into the, to the jungle warfare, you know, and stuff. And then it was even more advanced at, at in the NCO school. And so, uh, yeah, and, you know, we went through a lot of training there. We were out in the, we were out there in the field a lot. Did you NCO do a lot school. of land navigation? And oh, yeah, all that, which I enjoyed. Yeah. I enjoyed the land navigation, you know, and stuff. And I, you know, I did probably did pretty good. I was never lost, even in Vietnam. Misorientated, maybe, but I never lost. <laughs> but um, so I did that, and uh, and uh, then went back to Fort Polk. But when, you, when you graduated NCO school, then did do uh, what you promoted to E five? Yes, committee E five. When or? you went to the when you went to the NCO school, you were promoted E four. Okay. 
And then after you graduate, you could get you were promoted to either E5 or an E6, depending on how well you did overall. And I was going to promote to E5. And then you're back to Polk as what, cadre in a training yeah, unit? Yes, in a training unit for, uh, you know, I uh, did that for what, what, an eight or, what was it, nine weeks, I think? The cycle? Uh, the cycle, cycle, one yeah. cycle. And then from there, uh, you got your orders for Vietnam. And also you, uh, I don't know, I think I might have got a 30 day break, maybe. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, maybe a... Was that the first leave that you had? The yes. Training? Okay, so yes. you went to basic AIT, NCO school, then you had your, uh, then you got a leave. Yeah, I got a leave, yes. Well, yeah, you were, what, 30 days a year, I yeah, think. So it was. you were, uh, so you necessarily were 16, you were, you were in almost over half a year before you got a leave. Then, uh -huh, right? Yeah, well, we used to get in training, and when I was at Fort Knox, I was only like 150 miles from home. I got one weekend pass. Uh, and that was it. And then when I got down to Fort Polk, you know, even though the training was harder, more intense, it was hot, very hot. Uh, if he didn't mess up, you, you know, the I remember the drill sergeant was pretty good. You know, he was tough on you, but he was good too. And I think, it, you know, he ended up getting a lot of passes. There was no place to go, but, you know. And I think one time I went to, I think it was Lake Charles, Louisiana, took a bus. Go down on Lake Charles, maybe spend a night, come back the next day. Just to get away. Just to get away, yeah. yeah. Of course, there are other places to go to, but we won't go into that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, and that's basically what I did when I was stationed down there. And then I went to the NCO school. I went home. Well, wait a minute. Let me back off. For some, some oh, I know what was. I went to Fort Benning. And then Christmas time come around. Well, wait a minute. I did have my car down there. So maybe I did get a leave between AIT and going reporting to Fort Benning because I did have my car. Okay. I went and got my car brought down there with me. Really the first time on my own. Well, a couple of times I've been, I've gone somewhere on like a road trip and a buddy of mine, his car broke down. I, I said, I'll never go on a trip with him again. <laughs> One lesson I learned is to have a courier car prepared for a road trip. But uh, yeah, and then I uh, I came home for Christmas, so I had to leave then. Then after Christmas and New Year's, I think two weeks, you're we probably. Then we went back for training after that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think back then it was kind of customary for most training commands shut down at Christmas time. Sure. Yeah. I think like two weeks. Got, you know, two weeks, ten yeah. days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what we probably had. So now you got orders for Vietnam yes. at, uh, at Polk, your cadre in an AIT unit. Mm -hmm. Did they have any uh, other special training for you in at, at Polk before you... you uh, there were options you available to me. I didn't go through it, uh, like ranger training, okay. uh, uh, jump school. No, I don't know. That's okay. Uh, what, was there anything, uh, you know... Uh, more Vietnam appropriate. Well, the whole yeah. thing was oriented uh, toward the Vietnam War. But once and you got your, what I mean is, once you got your orders, is there anything that you you had to go like? What in, in my my case, when we got orders to Vietnam, we had the whole nine yards of you know we had to again ambush uh, procedures and make uh -huh. out a will and doctors well yeah talk, we had to do yeah, stuff yeah, like that all but that kind we of didn't stuff. have those procedures I think we basically oh. I, if I remember correctly went home on leave and then okay. and then reported to uh, Oakland Army Terminal and okay, that's so there in Oakland, there, in Oakland, Oakland California and, uh, how long were you in Oakland yeah. two days. And, and got there, and I decided, I'm going to see San Francisco. And I've heard about San Francisco, the scene there in San Francisco, so I wanted to see part of some of it, and I did. Now, in Oakland, uh, uh, did they tell you when you're going to ship out, or do they still have, the, you had to make the four or five formations a day? <coughs> the four or five formations a day, if I remember correctly, and, you know, kind of had that. And they call out people's names. Yes. And then, you know, yeah. they, they basically work like that, yeah. So you, uh, uh, you're in Oakland, and they call your name, and now yeah. you're at, what did you uh, uh, ship out over through Travis Air Force Base, or? Uh... 
I think, we, yeah, I guess it would be there by Oakland. And then from there, we flew to Alaska. Did you fly a commercial or were you on a military flight? It was a charter flight. Charter, charter flight. Charter flight. And we flew from there to Alaska. And if I'm not mistaken, we flew from Alaska all the way. To, is that possible? To Japan. Japan, yeah. And then from Japan to Vietnam. That. Yeah. I never really thought about that. Was that was probably the. I know when I, I left out <clears> of uh, Oakland and uh, Travis, and we went from California to Hawaii to Japan to Vietnam. Yeah, I remember going through Alaska. Yeah. I do remember that because I remember landing there in Anchorage. And I guess it was the sunset and there's snow on the mountains because this is April. Yeah. This is April of 1970. It was beautiful. I never saw those mountains before. And I, to this day, I remember, yeah. oh, wow, this is beautiful. And it was. It was awesome. It was almost kind of eerie because it's all this red. It's, you know, it kind of, you know, coming at you, you know, and stuff. But I do remember that. Then we went to Japan. And we had a little break there for a while, like we did. In, in Alaska, and uh, I, I don't remember a lot of that, you know, and stuff. And uh, but then I, uh, you know, then we went to Vietnam. Yeah, where did you land in the country then? Long Bend, I think. Okay. Pretty Long sure. Long Bend, yeah. Yeah, Long Bend. I remember flying over the countryside and seeing little bomb craters and stuff like that. Going, oh my God, uh oh, you know. And so we landed and. I remember this taking us out of the plane and kind of hustling us along and getting us on these buses, school buses, with maybe some type of, uh, what do you call it, around the windows? Yeah, like fencing or Yeah, green, fencing. Green, green, that's yes, the yes. Green and green then green they green took green. us yeah. to the, you know, uh, where you call that, where you check in there at the... Uh, the replacement thing? Replacement, yeah. yeah. Now I spent some time there. It doesn't seem like it was very long either. Now, now to backtrack, what you got your orders? Were you just ordered to that replacement unit, or did you have an idea of where you were going to be assigned to? No, no, I did not know where I was going to be assigned to. I remember that real well because when I was over there at the replacement company, or we heard rumors about what was going on. Of course, there were men who were coming back from the the bush who would tell you uh, I remember two specifically was the first captain about the 101st and they said you don't want to go to the 101st because they're getting their ass kicked or no do you want to go to the first cab because they're getting their ass kicked and I go I'm thinking to myself I'm going to either one of those um, <clears throat> okay uh, if I may backtrack just a little bit, on my way over to Vietnam, the men I had been in through these, so all this training, a lot of them I went over there in Vietnam with. We all went over there together. And so we would, you know, different people. A couple of names I remember is Dan Davis, he was from Illinois, and Daryl Dickey, who was from Kansas, because we had, uh, through our, a lot of our training, which might have included AIT, and the NCO school, uh, and then going to a training unit back at uh, Fort Polk, and we got to know each other, you know, and stuff. And those two went to the first cab, and I went to the hunt first. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, at the replacement depot, then they just called your name out and said you're going to go. Yeah, you Fort got Polk. in just like in yeah. Oakland. You just, okay. I think, you just get line formation again. Or something like that, if I remember, and they would call your name out. Okay. And then that's when you, when you got your orders. They, I guess, basically, that's when you got your orders and said, "Okay, you got to go here." And so you probably jump on a, you know, some motor transportation. Transportation. You go to the airfield, and probably I'm gonna say you probably got on C-130 and went on up there. Uh, did, uh, just backtrack, just just uh, just a little bit. In, in uh, Oakland, did they give you your jungle fatigues and that kind of thing, or did you uh, I just, travel in khakis and have to draw them uh, in country when you got? I want to say we got them in country. Okay, that's a good point, but I want to say in country, maybe we. It's when we got those. So from the uh, what was it, the 90th replacement depot in 
Saigon? I'm not sure. I'm Long sure. Band? Yeah, I'm not Is sure. Long Band? So, so I said, okay, 101st, so they trooped you over to an airport, and uh, you got on a plane, and where did you go to? No, we ended up at Camp Eagle. Camp Eagle. And then we went into the replacement company there. We went into what they called CERTs. And there, they would give you some training. Uh, and what kind of training would they give you there? Oh, they were just like a review and go over your training, zero your weapon. They take you out into a, uh, and you go out and zero your weapon in as best you could, and uh, just some refresher courses on what you were trained to do and everything. And everyone went through this. You and know, this was a, a Camp Eagle. This was a Camp and, Eagle. And that was the division's base camp. That right? was their yeah. That was their main. That was their main base that camp. Yeah, that was their headquarters for the yeah. first planet. How long did that training last? I don't know. Some people say a week. I don't know. It okay. kind of flew by. So you zeroed your weapon and they oriented you to the country and yes, mm -hmm. getting used to the heat and humidity yeah. and. Or maybe, well, I don't know, well, wait a minute, maybe back up as far as, you know, they just, you know, the, I don't know, maybe the zero, I'm getting that mixed up. When you zero your weapon, it's after you got to your unit. Okay. But that makes sense, right? You get your weapon after you get to your company area, because that's where they assigned you through the supply room. So that's, I'm probably getting that mixed up with that. But I think they went through some refresher training and stuff like that, probably except for the that part of it. Then after I left certs, I went up to my unit and got in my unit, and then I... Uh, then you were assigned to, uh, you went up to Delta Company, first to the 506. Yes. Now at that point, the 101st wasn't, I, I know Airborne's in your name, but you didn't have to be... Uh, no, they were Air jump. Mobile at yeah. this time, yeah. You had to be, they quit jumping, yeah. I guess, in 68. It okay. didn't work out too well for them, and so they... And this Air Mobile, and in fact, when you would sign your address, you put a 101st Airborne Division Air Mobile in parentheses. Okay. Today, they're known as 101st Airborne Air Assault. Air Assault, right. Yeah. We were the forerunner of the Air Assault. Yeah. So you, uh, now, now you're assigned to your company. Mm -hmm. uh, how were you, where was the company at? The company was out in the jungle. And the company had really been through some hard times. They had just had a company or a platoon virtually wiped out. They had been uh, under a lot of heavy contact on an abandoned fire base. I'm going to say maybe a couple of days later, I was sent out there to the bush. I want I, I want to say I went out with a uh, uh, with this one guy by the name of James Fowler. I always say we went out to the bush together, and he disagreed with me. Okay. But anyway, and we got out there together. And Oh my gosh, what have I gotten into? Now you went out on a log, a regular log bird yes, or whatever? Yes, log bird, okay. yes. Uh -huh. Went out there on the log bird and got off at the, you know, got off the LZ, you know, oh my goodness, look at all this, you know, tree blown away. Of course, you see all the craters and everything and bald tops of mountains that were once maybe fire bases. Beautiful country, by the way. You know, I really thought it was pretty. And go out there and I go, oh my gosh. And I met the company commander was there. We, while they took us back, we, we got off the bird. And then they went and they took in whoever came up and led us and took us and uh, met the company commander. His name was Don Workman. His call sign was Ranger at the time. And so everyone called him Ranger. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, he said something, he goes, well, do you know how to hunt? And I go, well, yeah, I, you know, I've done some hunting and stuff. He goes, basically all you're doing is you're hunting. And I said, well, okay. Uh, and uh, I remember Tish. And uh, because he had come out there, they had been on a riff and they had come out there and talked to, uh, and they were talking about the, uh, Reconnaissance patrol they had been on, and overhearing some of that. Then I was assigned to my what was left of my platoon, and there were about five guys in it that were left from the platoon. Wow. Okay. And they were the ones who had taken the uh, that uh, maybe a couple of days earlier had taken had been in that one uh, battle 
for their lives. And uh, I remember Gibb and Dean, John, Ernie Banks, Machine Gunner, and there's probably a couple more, and that was about it. So I became, what happened was, what was left of 2nd Platoon became an extra squad of 3rd Platoon. The 101st operated 3 platoons, 2 squads per platoon. So with uh, what happened with the 2nd Platoon, they made them an extra, platoon, uh, extra squad extra of 3rd Platoon. Squad. Yeah, an extra squad until we got new recruits in, of which I was one. And were you joining them then as a squad leader? Mm -hmm. e well, no, they had, they had a squad leader. Okay. Uh, Gib Rosser was an E5, uh, and he was the squad leader uh, at that time. And so uh, I joined them, and uh, poor old Dean Finch was given the assignment to show me the ropes, <laughs> you know, and stuff, and you know. And uh, so we, from that day on, and there was a lot of enemy activity in the area, so it wasn't long before we were getting in firefights or making contact with the enemy, light contact, nothing that had happened before to them. And these guys were real, I remember them being real serious because of what they'd been through, you know, what they'd been through and survived that battle, you know, and stuff, and they were hardened. Which is understandable. Great guys, great guys. I I know them well now. Good were, friends. Were you received well initially, or did you have to, uh, uh, resort reservations? Did, 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 yeah, you, with reservations. You had to pay your dues for yeah, of course, okay. of course. You know and stuff. And then uh, so we just uh, going on these missions. Uh, you know, and then set up ambushes or stuff like that and going out and every once in a while making contact and getting about the day-to-day -day business of being an infantryman, uh, helping the boonies, uh, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, we stayed out in the bush a long time. Now, now you're an I-Corps. Uh, were you in, in the heavy, heavy stuff like uh, yes, in, we were in, in the, the hills or were mountains. you uh, in, in the, the uh, okay. Yeah, at that time we were off what they call Marine Ridge Line. Okay. Uh, and we were just working that ridge line, and there was a lot of enemy activity in the way. And there were just things off and on that would happen. Uh, some of the things I've forgotten. Uh, I remember one time they were calling in napalm, and it almost landed on us, you know, and stuff. And. Uh, uh, you know, just things like that. Now they were bringing new men in. We were, getting, we were constantly getting new men in. They were putting them. Some of them were with us. Some of them might have been a replacement for third platoon because they had suffered some casualties. They had got ambushed trying to go to the aid of second platoon. Okay. So they suffered casualties, and so had first platoon that suffered casualties. But I would say probably the majority were coming to second platoon. And. Um, so, uh, I think Merle Delagrange came in at that time. Merle and I have remained friends throughout that time. Uh, and like I said, we were just humping the boonies, getting the fire, search and destroy missions, firefights, uh, calling support, mostly artillery, gunships, uh, airstrikes, pretty hot area. Were, were the fights, uh, were, were, was your contact then, would, would you consider it major or minor? Would, would, uh, it was more, minor, uh, but it was very intense. Intense what course, happens, but you know, uh, yeah. you wasn't know, anything you know, pitched at that point? Or, no, you know, like, not at that time. It, it was, uh, just get in these firefights and everything, and we would just uh, learn, you know, and I'd just fall along, you know, trying to learn. and. We tell you shoot, <laughs> you know. Okay, you know. So uh, at that time, and that's what we would do. We would just try to, you know. Well, I, I like to get on record. Basically, what your what you carried. What was your basic load? I carried an M16 with three ammo belts, 
seven clips per belt, so about 21 uh, magazines. And then those magazines, we never loaded them up to 20. We put maybe 17, 16, 17, 17 right? 19. Keep them from jamming. Yeah. Right? So they won't double feed. That's right. right. And I learned that, and I was taught that, and I was kind of told, hey, you don't need this, and you don't need to carry that, and stuff like that. Yeah, because it was, it was kicking my ass carry that rucksack. Because you carried your house with you, you carried your sea rations with you, your water, very important, the water. Very hot. How many canteens would you carry? I'd say at least maybe five, okay. maybe six. And uh, you, you, and they had some of these canteens were like bladders, and they'd hold more. But then they were more a little more apt to leak on you too. You think you got this? They'd hold like maybe two quarts. And then oh boy, I got this water left. Next, you know, you look at it, it's all wet. It's leak. You you run out of water. So I tried to keep the old style plastic right. canteens, you know, and stuff. And uh, we just, you know, and then we just go on the, on the missions and stuff and stay out in the bushes a long time. Now, were you also required to hump some uh, extra ammo for the, uh, for the machine gun? No, I wasn't. No, I carried just what I was supposed to. I might have at one okay. time. I've just forgotten. Okay. Uh, you know, and stuff, and uh, you know, your claymores, your frags, lots of frags. And I just made the base of a light weapons inventory man and, uh, and tried to learn the ropes as best I could. Would you keep most of your frags in the tubes, or uh, would you have them out? I think we'd have them out. Because okay. you have to understand where we were at was very, was very active with enemy activity. I never really saw that many because, of course, you know, being new, you know, unfortunately, we had good point men and slack men and stuff, and, you know, it kind of helped you out there. So, cause it, like I said, I was just learning the ropes. I'm kind of like, oh, what was that noise? And someone saying, you dumbass, get down. You know, you know, they're shouting it, and that's the nice word they were saying, you know. But anyway, so, and that's basically what, you know. Well, how, how much did, how much did your uh, equipment weigh everything that you had? So you had a bunch. It was never weighed, but I know it was a bunch because you. The thing it is with the hundred and first, it's when you would go your missions. I know. I know some divisions would go out on missions anywhere from three to five days, and then come back maybe to base camp. I know that's how some of them worked. I don't know how you guys work with the first camp, but when we went out on a mission. Our missions lasted anywhere, I want to say, from 45 to 60 days. A long time. The only reason you it, the mission might be aborted or anything is because of heavy contact and, lo and lots of casualties or, you know, something like that. But otherwise, we stayed out there. And there was a reason we stayed out there. There was a reason they kept us out there because there was a drug problem back at Camp Evans. And from what I've read in the book, Hell on the Hill, taught by General Harrison, I think there's a passage in there that states, you know, it, that talks about that, about leaving them less out there that long, you know, to keep us away from the drugs and stuff. And there was some violence back there too, from what I understand. So I never spent much time at Camp Evans. Was there any drug use out in the field? No, we wouldn't allow it. Was not allowed. If somebody was, you know, never. I know. I know. I know. It's been seen that later on in the years of 1969 and 70, these guys blowing through a shotgun and guys inhaling it. You know, no, that was not allowed. Never. Our area was too hot. I mean, there was going. There's a major buildup by the NVA there. They were getting ready for the big push there, and of course, with what happened with the the. Uh, uh, <clears throat> focusing all their attention on that fire space, support base ripcord. They did not want it open. The Ashaw Valley was their base camp. They did not want in, any Americans in that. Of course, all the things going on during the war, too. You know, uh, there were troops coming home. Uh, uh, 
campus unrest at home, the, you know, and the protest. Right. Kent State happened, I think, while I was, maybe while I was over there. Didn't that happen in 1970? I'm not sure when it came. Yeah, I it think it did. Around that time yeah, I think it did. Uh, so, you know, it was very volatile back home as far as the protest. Um, so, uh, you know, so all, basically it, you know, it really focused on the protests back home, is, you know, and stuff. And uh, we, of course, we were sad to hear the loss of the, the young people on the campuses, you know, and stuff. And everybody gets National Guardsmen or something. Some of these guys had just got back from Vietnam. So they claim. I never really had to check it out, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, they, you know they, some of these were veterans who had, were in the National Guard or I'm still on active duty, maybe not, maybe not National Guard, but active duty unit, you know. So, uh, but hey, that's basically what we did. It all came down to survival. Yeah. Looking after your buddy. And the Asha was tough. Yes. Yeah. We, we went come, there. I come to learn it. Yeah. We went there in 68. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's still tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was tough in 69, from what I understand, too. You know, with Hamburger Hill, yeah. all that stuff, too. Yeah. It was tough then, too. But the, yeah. So you uh, basically out, out on extended operations. And, yes. Uh, Search and destroy uh, missions. You know, and, you just, and that's basically all we did. Uh, what they call it, moments of boredom, followed by sheer moments of terror. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it, you know. On the whole, I mean, if you can quantify it, uh, you know, how many men did you have in your company at any one time? The most I can remember was in the 80s, okay. and that's after, we had suffered a lot of casualties after I'd first mm -hmm. gotten over there. So what the, what the battalion did, our, okay, everyone had an AO, an area of operation, and that usually involved a fire base. The 2nd Battalion, 506, had the Ripcord fire base. The 1st Battalion of the 506 had the Catherine. Our base Catherine, and and that's what the, you would work the area around there that the guns could cover. They'd always bring the, of course, they had to bring the 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 guns out to the jungle because they're not going to shoot from the low end. They can't make you know, so that and that's basically how we were. And what happened uh, at that one time, as far as the ripcord is concerned, the NBA decided we don't want ripcord there. It's on the edge of the. Uh, Shaw, we don't want anybody. We don't want American troops. Of course, you know, they're trying to kill a lot of American troops, too. Exactly. To make it to put even more pressure on the administration to get them out of there. Exactly. You know, the more they can kill, the better off it is. You know, and stuff. And, and I guess walk the first cab going into Cambodia. That took, that took a lot of the spotlight, if you want to call it, away from us. And all of it was focused on the first cab. Well, this up... Uh, you know, up with us was a major thing too, because we were going into their sanctuary. It was their base camp, the Asia. Uh, I remember one time I was told by a company commander of a of another uh, company that we were basically we uh, we were set down in their channel line. That's basically what he said to me. You know, exactly. Because of yeah. the because exactly. we were where we landed at, we were in the H R Valley. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, on those two days, July of nineteen seventy. But uh, uh, because during that time, I I don't believe there was there wasn't any other American division up that way. No, the hundred first I mean, took over the for. Marines have left. Yeah. And I think the, it was a fifth mech was the attached fifth to the mech first. Was running around the. Uh, yeah, up north uh, by DMZ. Over there. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, right, yeah. around by there, and and the uh, hundred first was stretched thin, mm -hmm. and I think at one time uh, during the ripcord operation, I think it involved about four hundred troops against many thousand NVA, from what I learned later in life, and um, they're trying to get the hundred first. You know, they had to have that spring offensive in nineteen seventy. You know. But, you know, be honest with you, I thought, well, you know, they're, you know, 
they're pulling troops out. I hadn't been over there, so I don't know. I'm 20 years old. What the hell do I know? And then I'm thinking, well, you know, go over there. It might not be too bad. We were talking to my friend before I went over to Vietnam. Talking to a couple of my buddies and stuff I grew up with. He, well, maybe you get over there, it won't be so bad. And uh, I get over there, and I give it to home first. And they're, having a major, they're trying to have a major offensive into the Asia, and it's not working. Because uh, the NBA did not want us in there. And wow. so there was a lot of stuff going on. And, and these offensive would always start in the springtime. Because, you know, because it rained, you, well, because it rained, you sock there. in the mountains, you're not coming in. You know, basically exactly. their monsoon season was during our winter season. <laughs> and they're monsooned, and it happened, and and so they could. And but they were out there all year. We we're you know back mm -hmm. in the lowlands, uh, uh, first ridge line maybe, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And they're back up in there, and you know they're doing a lot of work. Their work never stopped, from what I understand. They you know it slowed down yeah. maybe, but they you know. Mm -hmm. Just just to put it in perspective, when we went to Asia, we went with two brigades. Plus, there was a Marine Regiment and a uh, Arvin group that was coming up from the south, yeah. basically land yeah. on. But uh, so, and, and you know, I, I I can't believe that. And two years later, they fortified it a yeah. lot more than yeah. you know than they had, and you know what the you know how that Rickford thing went. Well, now you you've been in the field for a while. Uh, did you then become a squad leader? Yeah, I, eventually I became a squad leader. I remember. Being on Firebase Catherine, um, and we had to build up the Firebase defenses. I remember being on there. I remember being in charge of the detail and spreading the Constantina around, and you know, and stuff like that. Fortified positions and stuff like that. I remember we did that for about, I don't know, maybe about three weeks. And the same, and then as we were doing that, we were also getting new men, cherries, as they were called. Mm -hmm. Getting though they were coming in and everything, and we were, you take by late June, we were basically a new unit. You know, we had, I think, uh, maybe 80, 85 people total. You yeah, know, what was your TOE strength? 150 or so? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the squads might. Okay, two squads per platoon, plus the CP. So that's you know basically how it broke down the the three the three platoons and everything. And uh, and at that time, you know, we think, well, we're getting a lot of guys. But then you know, you later learn, but gee, you still were a half straight, mm -hmm. you know. And then that was all they were committing to them. How, how did how did you feel the uh, Obviously, you have to have new people coming in, but also the rotation policy, you know, people leaving, you know, after a year, people going back on R&R, &R, coming back, uh, people trying to pull rear area scams to get out of the field for a little while, uh, you know, <laughs> just, just, just turn something that was. How, and how I, did you feel that that affected your, uh, I, I if think you will, combat effectiveness? Uh, how boy, is it affected <coughs> When you know you you build up when you're working together, you build up cohesion and everything, and that was kind of lost. You know, you take me coming in as a new guy and and everything, and some of the the, the, the people who were there who had learned all the experience and everything. You now Sunday leave, and then that happened with me. I had built up experience. I had survived, uh, built up this experience, and then next thing you know, I'm going, you know, and stuff. But at that time, things had kind of quieted down. Uh, they had that one major offensive by the which the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, you know, uh, the, the, were part of that major offensive. When we were in the secondary position, we were basically in a defensive mode then. Uh, but yeah, sure. Well, I can look back now and say, sure. You know, it's kind of it's easy to. Look at a be as a 50, 60 year old man to look at the actions of a 20, 25 year old and maybe even a 40 year old and going, man, that wasn't very smart, was it? <laughs> you know, to be nice. But, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't get into that. We were what we were. Yeah. We did the best we could. Exactly. I know, I know from my perspective, I tried to do the best I could. 
against some overwhelming odds, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and when I got into a position of leadership, well, of course, the thing you wanted to do, you didn't want to see anybody get, anybody die. Right. They did. Uh, but I, you know, I can look back and say, well, I tried to do my best. I didn't want to get anybody killed. Now you were wounded. Would, would you care to talk, well, uh, address well, uh, this, this uh, happened. circumstances? <sighs> okay, after we had been on Firebase Catherine, of course, we were up to relative strength. Right. And then they sent us to the rear. At this time, the second of the 506. Now the rear being the Camp Evans. We were sent to the. Okay. I think we were sent to the rear then. And at this time, we were sent to the rear. We were pulled off of Catherine, and we went back, and we had a cookout and all this stuff. And, and all of a sudden, we found out we we're going to be going on a mission. And I remember Captain Workman, Don Workman real serious about this is going to be some bad stuff we're going to get into and you know when they you both go around and double check and make sure everyone had everything they needed everything worked you know everybody was in pretty good shape you know and all this stuff and uh, yeah because we knew we were going to hit it we didn't know how or why. Because at the time, the military didn't really know, let you know a whole lot. Just enough they thought that would that you needed to. Uh, and it might have been, well, if they would have let everybody know the truth, they might have lost some or might not have went, which was possible. So anyway, we were basically what, basically what happened was the second battalion, the 506, I told you their AO they worked around was Firebase Ripcord. Right. And then I said, so, you know, I told you about the NBA did not like that Firebase being there. Right. Put in simple terms for me. But anyway, then uh, what happened is that they were just suffering a lot of casualties. Uh, all three, four companies in the, in the recon, they had sustained a lot of casualties. So, what it was, was uh, they needed the, the, the uh, bat uh, battalion commander, Lucas was his name, needed more people. He needed more soldiers. So uh, during this time, and it happened before us, a lot of some of these units from different, from, you know, from other units, from the 501st, the 50 Deuce, uh, there were many were opconned to the 506 command, the second of 506 command. And we were one of them. And this was getting toward the end. It was really heating up and would get pretty hot. And a lot had suffered casualties. Just everybody has suffered a lot of casualties in this. Um, and we were and we were told, well this was what ended up, we ended up going to the record AO. And they had like Triple Hill, Hill 902, 805, uh, 1000. And, uh, and these were really some hot spots in that. What it is where they put Ripcord was not the most ideal area. First Cab had used it as a fire base, I think, too. But it wasn't the I'm most not ideal. sure. I, I heard that it had okay. been. So. But, but anyway, so what ended up, uh, is we uh, we got sent out to their AO. Remember we we flew out to the Triple Hill area. I don't remember any contact or it was light contact. Uh, I remember seeing a lot of bandages. A lot of people had been wounded around the LZ. We stayed there maybe a day, and then from there. We combat assaulted into an area south and east of Hill 805. What we were supposed to do, I think it was in the joint operation of another company, I think it was Alpha, 2nd of the 506. We were supposed to have a 
joint operation going up the ridge line back up to Hill A05, search and destroy missions, looking for uh, intelligence, anything. They went up one side of it, we went up the other. Well, needless to say, when we landed at the LZ at the 20th of July, uh, after about the second or third bird, we started getting uh, hot LZ. Or maybe it was after the second, first bird, but it was a hot LZ. So we got in there and uh, tried to get everybody together, make sure no one was wounded badly. I don't think anybody was at that point. Uh, I remember with my platoon uh, setting up a defensive perimeter around the, uh, the LZ. I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, like if we came in at 12 o'clock, when birds came into the LZ, like I think maybe at uh, 3 o'clock, it was like a ridge line up to a knoll. And I think maybe second platoon and maybe third platoon were all securing that area and at the nine o'clock position on the other side of the LZ, first platoon was securing that area. And now this is where I can uh, get kind of mixed up. I haven't read the book in a while, the, you know, the report book or anything. But I do know that that's when we started getting into firefights and we had to clear the, the that uh, saddle, I guess. We had to clear that saddle and get to that knoll. But in the meantime, 1st Platoon was running rifts off of, you know, recons mm -hmm. off the other side and they made contact and heavy contact. Um, I didn't really know it at that time, but they suffered four killed in action on that day. Uh, so we went up, the, the, the other platoons went up to close to the knoll to set up an NDP site, and then a lot of them, some of them were had to go back down to try to rescue those casualties from, from first platoon. Yeah, I can't really say a lot about first platoon because I wasn't in right. that time spot there. You get some guys from first platoon. I don't know if there's anybody here. They could tell you a lot about that, and they've got a lot to say too. One of the guys couldn't make it, uh, but anyway, we secured that area from the no down to the LZ, and then on the hot spot. Basically, we were where it was where first platoon where we were trying to get trying to get the men from first platoon trying to recover. When we were pinned down by fire, we couldn't go anywhere. We were just pinned down. Uh, of course, on this time, the, the choppers had left and everything, so uh, I mean, you couldn't you cross that LZ or get shot up. You know, there's a lot of in, you know, incoming. Uh, 51 caliber, they had some pretty big stuff. big stuff in that area. They had been waiting. They, you could tell they were, they were really prepared. And uh, uh, so then what happened, we couldn't get to get down to them. Some of them made it back, we couldn't get to that. Yeah, we just couldn't get it. So everybody regrouped on that knoll later that evening. And we were up there on that knoll. Some of us had dug fighting positions as much as we could rock. You know, but we did what we could, and so we set up on this know what was left of the company, and of course put LPs out and stuff like that. Uh, and then we were probed during the night. Uh, and then I remember the next day, the next morning. Uh, all of a sudden you heard that, you know, we were getting prepared to move out, move back down to the LZ. And then all of a sudden you hear thump, thump. You know, you kind of like, hey, what is this? Is this coming from, could be from records, because we were far from, we were far from the fire base itself. Thump, continuously, I guess. And next thing you know, we're taking the incoming in our NDP site. We suffered a lot of casualties there, a lot of wounded. Uh, 
they might have killed maybe three or four in that area. And we had to try to get back down to the LZ. So we had to hurry up and gather our equipment. I mean, this is in a short period of time. We had guys die. We tried to help them and stop the bleeding sure. and stuff. In fact, I carried Doc Hayes down uh, to the LZ, you know, to, to get a medevac and stuff. And uh, we had to set up a perimeter down there and set up our defensive positions down there, secure the LZ. Was that a we're getting fire? This, yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that hole from the knoll. Through to the LZ. I think they said, I read it in the book, that we took 80 rounds, someone counted 80 mortar rounds hitting our NDP site. So, of course, a lot of casualties. Uh, a lot of guys wounded. And so, what we did, and I think, yeah, that's when I got it too, got wounded. So, we all, you know, made it down to the LZ to secure the area for ourselves and, uh, uh, and then we were in battles all day there. We got gassed, we got rockets. Uh, we were in really a, the old saying, a world of hurt. Did they uh, use CS? Yes. Did you guys have gas masks? Yeah. I don't know where mine was though. I, and, uh, and the, uh, you know, with all the confusion going on, I didn't even know where the hell my rucksack was. I just knew I had my ammo and my frags, you know, and my, you know, that I had that with me. And your weapon? And that my weapon, that yes, yes, of course the yeah. weapon. You, the weapon was very important. Then went back down and like I said, we tried to secure the air and we got into, we were in a battle for a day long battle with them. And we were gradually taking cash because we're getting income, we're yeah. still getting more. And, and at this point you're wounded. Right. Yes, I got shrapnel in the back, Shrapnel's you know, and everything, back. and you couldn't, uh, we got the, those who were more seriously wounded got them out, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, we got them out, I, I stayed back there, and I think I asked somebody if they could see if I, you know, because my back was burning, and I knew that, but with the intensity of the battle, you just kind of, uh, you know, forget about it, the adrenaline, you know, right, and stuff, yeah. and, right. uh, and sometimes there would be a pause. You know, and then you kind of go, oh, what, you know, what is this, you know, and stuff. I remember it happening up there, but you had to get out of there and stuff. And so you just, and then all of a sudden, like I said, there's kind of a, like a lull, and you go, oh, shoot, there's something here, maybe. And so, uh, but I continued to stay, you know, stayed out there. A lot of them got medevaced out, and, and then, uh, and we just stayed there and tried to maintain our position as best we could. could in a defensive position, uh, and it got really bad, and we were gradually getting more casualties and everything, and the medevacs were super. Yeah, I, my hat's off to those guys for what they did. And then they, uh, and then what happened, uh, I remember going on a little reconnaissance patrol, taking about three or four guys, and we went up trying to get our dead. We left a couple of bodies up there. I think on that first one, we, we brought some, we found one and couldn't find the other. So we came back down and then we had to go back up. We went back up and got ambushed on the way up, back up. Now this is happening uh, over a period of time. Sure. And uh, we got ambushed. Uh, one of the guys with me is Paul Mueller. He was walking point, and I was kind of like slack. And at one time, we had two guys behind us, and I happened to turn around, and they were gone. So here's Paul and I out there by ourselves on a two-man patrol. <laughs> and um, <coughs> and you're wounded. Wounded. Then Paul's probably Paul wounded, wounded too. too. You know, maybe the other guys were too. You know, I think at the at, by the time it was all over, there were more wounded than weren't wounded. So. Uh, you know, uh, so we went back, and well, you're going to go back up and find our dead. You know, that's one thing we try to find our dead. And we kind of got into the argument with our CO because at this time, I think our platoon, our platoon leaders were wounded, and and I think one of them, uh, Lieutenant Smith, was still out there with. He was my platoon leader. He was still out there, 
and uh, so uh, Captain Workman said, well, you got to have to go back up there. And so at this time, me, another guy by the name of George Porsche, and a couple other guys went back up there and got back. I had a long point this time. Went back up there, we were going to see what we could do, equipment, bodies, if we could, you know, retrieve our dead. And so we went back up there and we got what happened. The enemy, as I'm walking around the NDP side, the enemy's coming up behind me and to my left. And I think as a guy, again, George hollered out, he turned around, he fired him up before he could get me. Uh, and at that time, we see more coming up over the bridge, over the hill there, and I fired at them. I don't know, but they went down. Could I hit them, or just because they were ducking or something? And and next thing you know, everybody's gone back to the NDP side. And I'm well, wait for me. I'll come back too. We went back down there, and so and that's how it was. We were just surrounded. We had uh, many many NBA surrounding us. Well, how eventually did you get out of that? Let's actually pause here because this tape is just about out. Okay. So we'll stop. This hot LZ and in all this uh, uh, this firefight pinned down. When? How did you get extracted and when? Well, if I may back up some okay. a little bit, we finally got to the point, I guess, where the mm -hmm. company commander. Captain he, Workman. Captain Workman. I, I can remember some conversations him having. And one even to the effect something was said about we were going to have, they didn't have anybody to come in and help us. And that we were going to have to stay there. And by this time we're running, you know, out of ammo. Fortunately we had an ammo drop. A lot of guys risked their lives to go out on that LZ. Could they, that LZ was zeroed in. I'm sorry. That, but that LZ oh, was sorry, zeroed oh, in. Sorry, I'm sorry, let me, uh, I forgot about this. Gentleman. Okay, let me just shut this off then. Let me put on vibrate. Okay. They had an ammo drop, uh, and obviously pe people risked them, their, their well lives going to, across that LG because it was zero in. Ammo. It was yep. taking incoming mortars, uh, 51 caliber fire, uh, whatever they could throw at us, rockets. They were throwing the rocket. They were getting rocketed. Uh, in fact, it came to a time after being there for su such a period of time that you kind of got an ear for it, if I may say. You could kind of, kind of tell, at least I could, I could kind of tell when they were close, okay. you know, after having all this incoming. Um, though I remember him telling us uh, that we were going to have to spend the night he didn't know if we'd make it through the night because we were, there was a lot of enemy in the area. It was in the thousands. Uh, and we were going to have to spend the night there and it might get down to every man for himself. And I can remember having conversations with people about would be taken alive. Uh, But then what happened, evidently, the battalion commander, the second of the 506, Colonel Lucas, Lieutenant Colonel Lucas, decided that he was going to bring D Company, the second of the 506, and C Company, second of the 506. He's going to have them come in and help us, to, you know, to help us out. And so by C Company, Security LZ, I think it was, D Company came in and humped to us from another LZ. And that was a hot LZ. All right. Uh, so they, 
I'm trying to get make sure I get these events because sometimes I, you know, over the years, trying to forget. Uh, and so they came over. I remember them coming in, and they found our. They had they had contact, but they found our our dead and brought them down too close to the LZ, which I was grateful for. Were these the ones that, that you went out a all couple the times the to uh, yes. retrieve? Yes. Okay. yes. And then they came down and helped us. Um, and so we were going to try and extract everybody from the LZ. And for some reason, uh, our company commander, there was a lot more going on. And I know I've missed a lot of it, but I'm just basing it on like what I know from, my, from the unit. Uh, decided that we were going to get out and he left some of us back and he got maybe out on the second bird, third bird out. And uh, what had happened is as that bird was coming, as the birds were coming in, the first one came in, loaded up, and got out, the second one came in. Was it just the one, one ship LZ? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And now, and, okay, now, in fact, I need to back up there again. There already, there was already a ship, she better back have been shot down. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was one, might have been two shot down already, not, you know, but, uh, oh, okay, well, I'm leading to. It's in the process of getting everyone out. He got out, on. he was going to go out on the third bird, I think it was. And the rest of us are securing the area, plus waiting for our turn. Okay, a lot of incoming. All right. Uh, and then what happened was that bird that had come in, and it's, you'd have to read the book. The book, the chopper that was coming in to land for him was actually crash landing. It was not under power. We didn't know that. Uh, I've been in touch with the guy, and I can't remember Larry's last name, but it was coming in for a crash landing. He had been shot up. He had no place to go. He couldn't make it back to Camp Evans. He probably couldn't have made it out of the jungle. Okay, so where do you go? Back to the LZ. Uh, was this after he this is after picked, picked up some guys? And yeah, was this leaving? was he was the like the, I think he was the third bird. Okay, so he, he yeah there was he, one he, two he had come in his, there uh, and I think in the process of what he happened is when come in there was kind of like a hold up. I think what happened was when the choppers got ready to take off, they had to come up and do a, a reverse and go back the way they came in. And in the process, that held him up and some of the others, and, and I guess he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they really shot him up. Okay. All right? So he couldn't, he couldn't land then, so he said, okay, hey, I'm shot up. I'm going to have to go, you know, go back to, I guess, trying to make it back to Evans while he wasn't going to. You know, his bird was on fire and everything, so he came back around. And unbeknownst to us, he was crash landing. We thought he was landing, you know, to pick up. So unbeknownst to the guys who were getting on there, including our company commander, they all started when the bird's coming down like this. He, they're all going out there to catch the bird, and the bird is kind of wobbling coming in. Next thing you know, it kind of I can't remember what side it landed on, but uh, it landed on, the rotors broke off, and one of them cut our company commander in half. Uh, it came like across this way. I remember seeing what I thought was maybe a rucksack going through the air, and it was parts of his body. So that needless to say, after that happened, you know, going, oh my gosh, what more can happen here? I think he was the only one killed there. There might have been a couple of wounded. I think they all got out, including the guys in the helicopter for the majority, and a couple of guys had to, a couple of our guys had to go down there and dig up, someone was pinned underneath the chopper. A couple of guys went down and got him out from underneath the chopper and brought him back out. And to the relative safety of the, uh, 
the one, the three o'clock position of the LZ. Now, couldn't use that. There were two helicopters shot down on there now. We couldn't use that LZ. Uh, what we had to do, but we wanted to turn around and walk. And this is where it gets kind of, you know, because it's all kind of like a blur. We, we, kind of we had to go to another LZ. They knew another LZ we'd go to, so we had to hump to it. Uh, we couldn't take our dead. There's no way we could take our dead. Uh, the company commander of D Company, Sector 506, they were going to have to leave. We didn't have enough men. They had a lot of casualties. D Company 2nd, Charlie Company of the 2nd, that stuff, they were down to half a, half a company, maybe less. You know, maybe 30 guys, 40 guys. Uh, you know, I always thank them guys for coming in and helping us out because. You know, they, you know, that's something else to have to go in there and rescue somebody else when you were, you were, you were in dire straits yourself, you know. So we had to hunt back to this hilltop. I want to say it was Hill 605 comes to mind. And you could, you would get shot up even, that was a hot LZ. And we get shot up, we got on the bird. I'm trying to remember who I was with. I want to say my buddy Dean was on there, who had kind of guided me through, you know, helped me out uh, as far as becoming the squad leader. And he was on there, and I'm trying to think, I can't, I remember Dean specifically. And I remember getting on the chopper, and they finally got us out. We went back to Camp Evans and we landed. And I remember guys uh, coming out to greet us. And I remember this one particularly, his name was Cervantes, who was in my, in my squad, coming out there and telling me, he goes, Tony, I'm really glad you made it out. And I said, well, I'm glad you made it out too, Frank. And, uh, So that's basically how it ended for us. Okay. And then what happened to you with uh, being wounded then? Okay, I, you get medical I went attention back to or? the uh, 326 of VAC, I think was what it was. And I just went back there to see what was going on because I still had the back pain. Okay, now mm -hmm. the pain comes back again. And so I went back there and. Uh, uh, and they stitched me up and fixed me up, and they said we're going to put you in for a purple heart. Back at the back there, so I said, oh, okay, I you know. Then I don't know, at that time it didn't really mean anything. And they returned to duty. Uh, after a couple of weeks. Okay. I, I don't know. If, I can't really remember what all they did, and it was superficial wounds, and I'm so, grateful for that, okay. you know, and stuff. And then I like some of the guys who uh, got met back down and never saw again. Yeah. And uh, so at that time, uh, you know, that was basically how I remember that. And, and they had to rebuild the company again. I was going to ask you, because you said when you committed to that action, the company was considered it pretty pretty full strength. Pretty, About pretty good 80, strength. 80, 85 yes. guys as opposed to you know, whatever. What was your effect? Do you know? Have an idea of what the effect of strength was when you were evacuated out of there? Fifteen to twenty. Okay. Maybe not even that. Okay. I can remember someone saying something about who else was with the first battalion of the five hundred six, saying something about uh, they had a form they had a battalion formation. And when they got out there, there was no one from D Company out there. Wow. I do remember that. Uh, and that, like I said, after that is just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I stayed in the rear. Uh, the company was regrouping, and then we ended up going to a fire base, I think. There was a lot of us who, 
who probably were wounded like I was, you know, and stuff, and uh, probably went back to the company, which wasn't unusual, mm -hmm. you know. I think Dean was injured too, wounded too. And now he's probably his second, maybe his third Purple Heart. So did you stay uh, medically, did you just stay at Evans or? Yeah, I just stayed at Evans, light duty probably. Um, going to have the bandages changed and stuff like that because you didn't, you know, you could get to worry about, you know, infection, infection yeah. you know, which was rampant. Any problem with you on infection? Or? No, I seem to heal pretty well. One problem with me, I got badly sunburned. You know, like complexion. I got badly sunburned. My lips were even sunburned. Got Ed Evans? Yeah. No, back at Catherine, out there in the jungle. <coughs> really badly sunburned. And now I have skin cancer. Mm -hmm. On my face. It's all I'm treated for, not the rest of my body. Just my face, okay. and occasionally on my hands. And then I think, well, what was I wearing then? During those times, you know, young fatigues rolled up to about here. Your your fatigue shirt, right? In your face. Exactly. And so I've had to, I've had to battle with skin cancer since that time. But I remember being badly burned on the lips, and I think that got infected too. Mm -hmm. You know, bust open and bleed. You know, and stuff, and then we went to the rear, and I got some medication for that and everything. And, uh, and I, st I had a constant problem with that. Well, you know, that was just July, or 1st of August, you know. And still, I had to go back out in the jungle, you know, and they brought in a bunch of new troops. But unfortunately for the some of the troops down south whose divisions were going home, guess what? Instead of going home, they got transferred to the 101st. Right. I was going to ask and that you happened that. even before, you know, it you had to happen even before, <laughs> and it happened more so after what happened to us in that battle. Uh, you know, and it was, it was uh, something else, and uh, you know, it's kind of fun. I know we, we, were, we were in like minor skirmishes and stuff like that, but nothing compared to what we went through at that battle. Uh, of July of 1970, that that lives with me always, and a lot. Some of the other stuff, I, I can remember from May to August 1st pretty well, or July, the end of July pretty well. But then after that, it kind of fades. And I know we were. People have told me we were in battles. And after that, after I had been in second platoon, and then I guess because of the many casualties in third platoon. I was transferred to third platoon as a squad leader, and I ended up with third platoon the rest of my tour over there. And I was still a squad leader. I, just, I basically remember squad. I remained a squad leader for the majority of my time, with occasional. I think every for maybe a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, I became a platoon leader. Okay. With third platoon, and that, you know, uh, you know, because we still suffering casualties and stuff, but. You know, even in that position, it was, oh my, even more, you didn't want to get anybody hurt. You know, and then you you wonder about the futility of it all, you know, all these what, battles and stuff. So. What, what was the morale of the guys? Uh, obviously, they know the U.S. is winding down, you know, its commitment and uh, this and that. But you, you know, I, I, it, for some it could be bad. I know there's time that was probably bad for me, but... Considering what we went through and the psychological effect of, of that period of time, very volatile for our country, um, I don't think it was that bad. It could have been better. Sure, sure it could have. Uh, but at that time then, all you did was try to, as you know, win more in battle to help your brother. And make the best of a worse situation. The, yeah, right. Yeah. That's all you could do. And that basically, I look back on it now, and that's basically what we did. Yeah. Every one of us, from squad, platoon leader, squad leader on down, is to save each other, help save each other, if we had to. So, And in the end, you, you create that strong, special bond of an infantryman that had been through battle. 
And that's why you have this, you know, you, you get that, and that's, a lot of people can't understand it unless yeah. you, you went through it. Did, uh, uh, what was the racial makeup of the unit when you were there? I'm thinking probably close to what the maybe what the racial makeup for the country was maybe. So about eight, ten percent African American. Yeah, you know, I would say maybe that. I know we had a lot of problems in the rear. Uh, with people not wanting going out to the bush, and there was some racial strife back there too. But I, I guess you know, in the end, that that worked with with the uh, the division commander wanting to keep the combat troops out in the bush to keep us away from that. And, then, and I would say, yeah, well, that worked out pretty good. Not to say that when we got to the rear. There was nothing wrong with a nice cold bear to do me to go along with it. But that was recreational use. It's not like, uh, you know, how it was. You know, you, you're a Vietnam bed, you come back to Vietnam. God, you're the expert when it comes to pot. No. I just, for recreational use, it was a way to wind down. Just the beer and the pot went together, you know. And you use it maybe to get high and feel good under the circumstances, but I would say for the most part, I know when I was in the position like I was, and we went out to the bush, we had our act together. We weren't going to go out, and we never, and I don't re ever remember that being out there. It might have been, but I can't ever remember that being out there when we were out there. We wouldn't allow it. Especially when we were in third, third platoon, we never allowed it. Because Merle was a squad leader, and I was a squad leader. And we just wouldn't allow that stuff, no. So there no racial tension out in the field? Uh, or, uh, Some people uh, said there was. Yeah. I, I don't remember a whole lot. I'm not saying that it didn't. It just that I didn't maybe see that much. I didn't, at least and in there's the squad. A, and, then, or, and, and, hmm? and there could be some in the squad, but I, I told you about the James Fowler who went out to the bush with me. Well, when we were in St. Platoon, and I became the squad leader. He's a black man. He was he's a good friend of mine today. And he was my machine gunner. And he had a way to temper that. Now James joined, uh, joined the military. And so he was in for a while. I think maybe even three or four years, I can't remember. So maybe in that respect, he helped temper that with me. And there, if there was you know, some guy saying, oh, he's just picking on us, you know, and stuff like that. James would come in and said, oh, you know, and, and which would work to our, to our advantage of the whole squad. Sure. And he's a dear friend today. You know, I wish he could have made it up here, but he couldn't. And so we have kept in touch over the years, you know, and stuff. After losing contact with everybody for about the first, well, over 10 years, I decided to get in contact with everybody, started looking for through different organizations, through luck, you know, and everything. I remember him quite well. So now your years winding down. Tell me about your dealers process. Okay, I got a drop. My uh, my dealers would have been April twenty. No, no, no. Okay, what? I'm trying to think how long before you. I, I was going to ETS out of the Army. Right. All right, because of all the training I went through. One thing I lasted that long, couldn't believe it. But no, I was there for nine months, went on hard and hard, had a good time. Come back and immediately try to put in for a leave. I was denied. I thought at one time maybe I might get a rear job, you know, you know, being a, uh, you know, in some position. That didn't pan out either. So. You know, and I said, so I spent my whole time out in the bush. Uh, and then when it came close to D-Rose, uh, they brought in a new, at that time I was a squad leader, we had a platoon leader. I was a squad leader, we had a platoon leader and a, and a, first, and a platoon sergeant. Uh, and then I was a squad leader, Merle was too, and uh, 
I'm going to get a new squad leader in, take my place. His name was Bass. Good guy. He had served a tour over there in Vietnam with the exact same company. Oh, really? And I guess, I don't know if he requested to go back with Delta Company, but he was back with Delta Company first in 506. He was a buck sergeant. And uh, he took over the squad. Now, Okay, I was relieved of, you know, basically relieved of duty. I'm just another grunt now. Uh, well, basically, when he came out, I had to sh kind of show him the ropes, you know, and stuff like that. And, and then he finally took over the, uh, the control of the squad. And uh, the day I was supposed to get out of the bush, they canceled the, uh, they canceled <laughs> Cancel it. I had to wait an extra day. And then finally, we were in the Lowlands at the time. We were we were like around the first ridge line around Camp okay. Evans, uh, patrolling the area, secure for this because this was the other operation was going on. We talked about it earlier. And so then I uh, I finally got out of the bush. I went to my wife. I had two weeks to be home, but, but two weeks prior to going home, I got out of the bush. I think it was maybe not even that long. It seemed like by the time I turned in my equipment for a couple of days, I was out of the area and going down to the replacement company, Al Cameron Bay, this time. And I got there, got on the bird. You know, the bird took off, everybody let out a big chair. I remember that. Long flight back. I think we flew to Japan. And then I think at that time, maybe because of the airplanes they were using, another charter plane. By the time we got on the, I think we flew from Japan all the way to Fort Lewis, Washington. And I remember coming in, we're getting close, seeing the, uh, seeing the, uh, the ocean, and all of a sudden you see the, you know, you see the United States coming into view. Everybody let a big chair, then you see the coastline and everything that was always over. Wonderful sight, and I also got to see Mount Rainier, which I thought was oh, man, that is really neat. So we flew to Fort Lewis, and and knowing that I do I ETS down there. How long were you in Lewis? Three days, maybe. Okay. And so I got out. I think the fifth of April, nineteen seventy-one. I want to say. My parents didn't know I was coming home. Oh, first I, instead of going military standby, I think I changed my clothes, put on some civilian clothes that I'd had from r, r I put them on after I ETS, got a cab, waited for a couple of guys, and we all took a, got a ride down to the Tacoma SeaTac, sea -tac. Sea -tac. Sea -tac. yeah, and went there and got me a flight. I had to fly from Seattle to Chicago, the connector fly from Chicago to Indianapolis. I went first class. I said, hell with military standby. And I was on the 747 at the time. And I want to say it was a double-decker. Well, some people said, no, it wasn't, but I'm pretty sure it was. And and so I remember it, very nice flight, and they went, what would you like? And I said, give me a whiskey and water or whiskey on the rocks or something like that. So that was nice, and I was sitting there relaxing, there were movies on and stuff. And, and I think I got finished with that, and I had maybe one more, and I passed out. <laughs> so needless to say, I did not enjoy the rest of my flight. To, in fact, I think they had to read, they had to wake me up when I got to Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, you're here, so well, I had to hurry, and run, get connector flight going. I didn't ask you to interview. Where, where did you go on R and R? Taiwan, Taiwan, Taipei, okay. single guy. Yeah, okay. Didn't have anybody in my life at the time. Been there and had a good time. Went with a marine on R and R. Mm -hmm. He's on R and R too. We probably both from the Midwest or something. You know, hey, let's go together. We did. He's a great guy. And uh, we went on R&R &R together and had a good time and 
come back out and I thought, well, maybe I can get me rid No, you're going back out to the bush. And I'm saying, hey, God, uh, what you saw back there, forget about it. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, that was you know. just testing your forgiveness. Yes, I'm testing your forgiveness, yeah. yes. Uh, so, so you get back to Indianapolis, uh, surprised the family. family. Yeah, they didn't know. I just, I didn't tell them. I, they knew I was coming home. They probably thought maybe I had to my, to, which would have been like around the, later on in April. Yeah, and you got about a two-week drop or whatever. Yeah, three, I think 21, 22 days okay. is how it ended up. And so I come home and I surprised them. Got to Indianapolis, tried to get a, a cab to my house, which was probably where my parents lived, was about at that time about five miles from the airport. Couldn't get a cab because there were a lot of planes coming in with uh, soldiers who they were going to AIT at Fort Benjamin Harrison there in Indianapolis. AIT, AIT at Fort Ben. Bean counter AIT. Right? Yes, yes, and that was hard for me to get a cab. I remember I was getting pissed. I finally got one. Went home and surprised them. Of course, they were happy to see me. Uh, I remember there for a while, I I guess I really just got depressed. I didn't write anybody. So my parents got upset. <laughs> Next thing you know, I got a letter from Congressman or Senator. Company commander says, you go write a letter to your parents now. And so I had to write a letter. I just, you know, after what I've been through, it took me a while to get back. And then I started riding again. So. And, uh, and that basically it. Came home, run around for a while, got married, had kids. And lived the rest of your life. Read down. Um, that's, got divorced. Uh, just didn't work out. About the year 2000, so I've been, you know, on my own. Got a good relationship with my son. Well, thanks for sharing your story. It was okay. just fantastic. Appreciate okay. it. All right. All right.